I knew, that, literally, a four-year-old child, I knew that I was in the wrong sex. I knew that I was a girl. By the time I was 15, the gender dysphoria was so strong. My hair was down to my shoulders. And if somebody mistook me for one of my sisters, I was flattered by that. I would fantasize and go out in the backyard yeah. in my bathrobe. And as the wind would blow my hair and my right. and my dress, I would fantasize about maybe one day I could be a real girl. Yeah. And you know what? They have laws to protect people like me. And and now they, if a child at seven or eight years old comes forward and says that they're a girl in a boy's body, the government will step in against the will of the parents and give the child the hormones that they desire so that they can have the sex change. How did you get to that point, though? What was it like growing up, struggling with these same-sex attractions, but also feeling a little bit gender dysphoric? So you say trans. I just want to communicate to the audience that you really mean that you felt like I should be a girl. I should be a woman. How did that taper off? And how did you change your views about yourself from a gender standpoint, from a sexuality standpoint, and a spiritual standpoint? Well, that's a lot. Well, let me break it down. Oh, um, start kind of at the beginning. At four years old, I knew, that, literally, a four-year-old child, I knew that I was in the wrong sex. I knew that I was a girl trapped in a boy's body. There was there was absolutely no doubt in my mind. How did you know? Can you explain that? How did you I just know? know? It, it was one of my first conscious thoughts because, because yeah. you know how I knew? Because every time I gravitated towards the things that were natural to me, which mm -hmm. was playing with dolls and putting on dresses and you know, avoiding sports and that kind of stuff, I was redirected. You know, no, no, Mike, play with this, play with the bat and ball, you know, don't play with the Barbie or whatever. And there was a struggle. And then eventually I got punished if I got caught dressing up in my mother's clothes mm. or my sister's clothes. And I saw that they were getting like the beautiful dresses and I had to wear brown shoes or black shoes. I hated it. And I felt like I, felt like I was not living according to myself of what I was naturally. And to me, I wanted to be a girl. I wanted my hair long. I wanted to wear the dresses. So it was a constant reminder. And, and they basically talk about how transgender children or children with gender dysphoria struggle with a, a functional type of depression because again, they have this conflict. And the conflict was the very first thing that I, I realized as a four year old. I still remember that. It's palpable even today at 60 years old. Mm -hmm. So um, as I was growing up, I didn't realize that I had defensively detached from my father. And that's a, a scientific term. And it happens uh, between the ages of one and three. And it's a rejection of the same gender parent. Mm -hmm. So either that same gender parent isn't available or yeah. maybe they're abusive or there's many reasons. But no child is really conscious until about three or four years old. So between one and three, little boys start to realize that they're not like their mothers or like their dads. So there's this transition that has to take place. And then uh, imitating masculine behavior is is gender affirmation. So when, when I was looking for my same gender parent, my, my dad was a musician in the Navy, so he would be gone three to six months at a time. So at a time when I needed that example, he wasn't there, but then when he was home, he was this hot-headed Italian. He was abusive. He was loud. And in my little subconscious mind, I put this together that I looked at him and said, if that's my gender, no thanks. I, I, I don't want that. And I totally rejected yeah. that. So the only example left for me, John, was my mother. She was safe. She was quiet. She was available and she was nurturing. And so I thought, well, I don't want to be like him. I want to be like her. And that's where I believe that all of a sudden at four years old, I'd already been imitating her and wanting to be like her. So my gender identity was really more feminine than it was masculine. And that followed me until I was 20 years old. Here's what happened. You know, what reinforced that, John, was when my father would force me to go out with him shooting guns, you know, trying to butch up his son or he'd take me out. Uh, he was a policeman and then he would take me out uh, to attack trained German shepherds and you know, everything about masculinity was aggressive and yeah, it was hostile. And yeah. It, yeah, it was a total turn off. You know, so I just wanted to be coloring in my coloring book and playing with Barbies and paper um, dolls, same. you know, at home. Same. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So I didn't even, I didn't relate to him. 
and every exposure to masculinity was only more frightening and rejecting. So it was reinforced. But so then when I go to school and the boys pick up on my effeminate mannerisms, I was a little kid. My mother put me in first grade at five years old. And that's, you know, now I'm five foot four now, you know, so in first grade, I was a, a, a runt and emotionally immature and I'm five years old in first grade. And so everything was really overwhelming and I felt inadequate. And then the boys started calling me sissy, queer little girl, which right. pushed the one thing that I needed more, even further away. And that was masculine affirmation and belonging. Mm -hmm. And I believe that eventually that led to same sex attraction because the hole that was in my heart was this emptiness of masculine love, mm -hmm. not sexual, but mm -hmm. masculine love and affirming, which, be, which, was, which began at the rejection of my father. And then eventually it led to the boys in school. And then by the time I was 15, the gender dysphoria was so strong. My hair was down on my shoulders. And if somebody mistook me for one of my sisters, I was flattered by that. I would fantasize and go out in the backyard yeah. in my bathrobe. And as the wind would blow my hair and my, right. and my dress, I would fantasize about maybe one day I could be a real girl. Yeah. And you know what? They have laws to protect people like me. And, and now they, if a child at seven or eight years old comes forward and says that they're a girl in a boy's body, the government will step in against the will of the parents and give the child the hormones that they desire so that they can have the sex change. Like now, around 15 that's not here in America, old. correct? Is it somewhere else? Yeah, it is. It's in America. Yeah. In okay. America. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so great. if that was the law when I was a kid, John, yeah. I would have been standing first in line. I would have. Been, I would, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. would have fought you. I would have fought you for that. But anyway, oh, okay. um, so then what happened for me is I even thought that as a Christian that that was the only solution. You know, at 13 when I had same sex attraction, um, I. I eventually just gave into it. I quit fighting it. And, you know, it was what came naturally to me. And so I prayed that God would change me and that never happened. And so even more the thought that if I transition to be a female, then my attractions to men would be acceptable. And then maybe God would love me. Do you see how twisted that all got? Yeah. Yeah. So that it followed me sense. until it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So but at 20 let, years old. Let me ask you a question. So you were praying to yeah. God. Did you have a family that was religious or did they believe in God? What did, what were yeah. you thought? Yeah, my yeah. family was fairly religious. We were good Catholics. Um, I remember my mother um, took us to church every week. And when my dad was home, he would go. My dad had an affair with um, a waitress in one of our restaurants. Wow. And um, he left my family for her. And then he got baptized, another Christian faith. And so... Um, you know, he was an elder in the church or whatever. So eventually I became uh, baptized in that church, you know, still thinking that I knew that God existed, but I thought that God was like my dad. And I thought that he was arbitrary and cruel, kind of dismissive and unavailable. And, and so I really, I really thought that, that God was like my father. Somebody said it so accurately, and I want to use his words. He said, it took me 50 years to wipe the image of my father's face off the image of God. Yeah. Yep. That was it exactly. So I really, I really credited God with the same attributes that my father had. And so um, I didn't serve God because I loved him. I served him because I feared him, but I knew he existed. I was never atheist. I was never agnostic. I knew that God was out there. I basically just thought that he didn't care about me and that, yeah, that he wasn't available. Nor did I think that he was powerful because for all those years that I prayed, he never answered that prayer. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty. Oh, so what's that? Thank you for your honesty. That's that's a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You you can have you you'll get that because I, I have no other truth. But at twenty years old, when I walked away from uh Christianity and I said, I'm done. I can't get my sexuality and my religion to come together. So I went into the gay world and all of a sudden my eyes became open that masculinity is much more valuable than femininity. Yeah. And so if I wanted to be held by a man or to be loved by a man, I had to butch it up a little bit. So being a, a short little guy in the gay culture who's losing my hair, 
you know, you had to package yourself in such a way that really got, garnered some attention right. or you have to be really cute or funny or whatever. So yeah. I realized that if I butched it up a little bit that I found that I got much more attention from men than the other way. Okay. And then as I fell into sexual addiction, then I became very comfortable with my male parts and my male parts were what was getting the attention. And so I never struggled with the transgenderism anymore. That was gone. The dysphoria was gone and I fully embraced being male, but now I was sexually addicted in the gay culture. So here, John, is the big dilemma. If I would have had that sex change at 16 and then all of a sudden re realized at 20 that masculinity was more valuable to get male attention. Can you imagine how screwed up my life would have been? Yeah. Because I would have mutilated my body to where there was no turning back or going back. Yeah.